my water just broke. I felt like things really intensified. She was right there and she was coming. It was, it was an amazing feeling. I'm gonna cry just thinking about it. I could feel her head. We heard her cry. We were squeezing hands and she was screaming. <laughs> I'm Bryn Hunt Palmer and you're listening to The Birth Hour. This podcast is designed as a safe place to come together and share childbirth stories. Stick around and join us to hear informative and empowering birth journeys from all over the world. Today's episode is brought to you by SMP Therapeutics, makers of the Gene 8 test. Based on over $16 million in NIH grants and more than 30 years of nutrition and genetic research, SMP Therapeutics is leading the charge in the field of prenatal precision nutrition genetic testing. SMP Therapeutics is committed to providing accurate and usable information to help mothers provide the best possible nutrition to their babies through the Gene 8 test, a prenatal precision nutrition genetic test that offers personalized dietary adjustments and supplement recommendations based on your DNA. You can rest easy knowing that your prenatal nutrition has been optimized by tailoring it to your genetic code. Find peace of mind about your prenatal nutrition with the Gene 8 test by SMP Therapeutics and learn more at genate.com and use the coupon code BIRTHHOUR15 for 15% off your order. At the end of this episode, I talk with Kara from SMP Therapeutics all about the Gene 8 test and its benefits, so stay tuned for that conversation. Okay, before we get to today's birth story, I just wanted to chat a little bit about a couple other aspects of the Birth Hour community. If you're new to the podcast, you may not know that we also have an online childbirth course. It's called Know Your Options. It's 12 modules of all evidence-based information. Where I've partnered with a childbirth educator, a birth and postpartum doula, and lactation counselor to cover everything from final weeks of pregnancy through preparing for your birth, any type of birth. We go over everything, starting with planned cesareans and going through unmedicated versus medicated inductions, really any kind of thing that might come up for you so that you can be prepared no matter how your birth goes. And then of course we talk about postpartum and caring for your baby. And then there's a bonus course that comes with that that is called Beyond the First Latch, where we talk about feeding baby, pumping, storing milk, going back to paid work, all of those things. That's an additional six modules that is free with the main course, or you can buy it separately. You can find out more about the course, including detailed outlines of everything included at thebirthhour.com slash course. And along with that, you also get access to a private Facebook group just for our childbirth course students and biweekly Zoom calls where we get together and get your questions answered or just connect and find community to join the course, head to thebirthhour.com slash course, and you can use the coupon code 100OFF for $100 off enrollment. Lastly, I just want to mention that we have a Patreon page, which is really the heart of the community of The Birth Hour. So many of those members have been members for years and years. We get new members every single day, and this is a place where you can connect with people who listen to The Birth Hour, love hearing birth stories. Most of us are in this stage of life where we're having and raising babies, so it's a great place to ask questions and find community, and everyone is so, so supportive in there. So when you sign up to support the podcast via Patreon at the $5 a month level, you get access to our private Facebook group where all of this community is happening. And we also have monthly Zoom calls. If you want to chat face-to-face, that's a great place for that as well. And along with that, you get access to all of our archived episodes, which is over 600 additional birth stories that are not in your main podcast feed. And Patreon makes it really easy to listen to those. You get your own private RSS link to set up in your phone where they just come right into your podcast app where you're already listening to the main podcast. And of course, all of the instructions on how to do that are right there when you sign up for Patreon and also link at the top of the Facebook group as well. So if you would like to join that community and help to continue to support the work that we do at the birth hour, you can find all of that at patreon.com slash birth hour. It's also linked in your app and on the show notes. All right. Today's birth story guest is Jennifer and she has two home birth birth stories to share with us. Hi, Jen. Welcome to the birth hour. Thanks for being here today. Hi, Brian. Thanks so much for having me. Yes, of course. I know a little bit about your births from the Patreon Zoom calls, but I'm excited to get them all recorded today. But before we get to your stories, can you tell listeners a little bit about you and your family? Yeah. So hi, my name is Jennifer Berzik. I am 32 years old, almost 33. 
I live in Bend, Oregon with my husband, Yasin, and our two children, Walker, who is four, and Summer, who is 21 months. My husband and I have been together for 12 years. We met in October of 2011 when I was studying abroad in Australia. We did long distance for about a year and a half while I was finishing school in the U.S., And then after I graduated, I moved to the Gold Coast, Australia in 2013. We got married a little over five years ago in August of 2018. I have my master's in public health and my diploma of nursing. Prior to becoming a mom, I originally worked as a nurse. And after I got my master's, I worked at the University of Queensland in their School of Public Health. And I worked on an amazing health initiative called Be Upstanding, which helps workplaces stand up, sit less, and move more. And now I am a full-time mom and homemaker. All right. Well, let's go ahead and start with your first pregnancy, getting pregnant, anything you want to share there? Yep. So before we get into that, I just wanted to say that is my absolute dream come true to be sharing my birth stories on the podcast today. So thank you so much, Bryn. (laughs) I have been listening to The Birth Hour since February of March of 2016. So I'm a longtime listener. Yeah. I'm obsessed with birth and I'm so excited and happy to be sharing my birth stories today. Oh, good. And so trying to conceive, I have known that I wanted to be a mom since I was about three years old and I've always wanted four kids. So after my husband and I got married, I went off birth control. I had been on the Nuva ring since I was 19 and I was 28 when we got married. My parents actually experienced eight and a half years of infertility and they started trying when my mom was 22. So I didn't want to waste any time and I was very ready to become a mom. My cycle prior to going on birth control was always very regular, but I knew it could take some time for my body to regulate after being on birth control. And I was right. I had a 52-day cycle, and my cycles actually never really regulated before I got pregnant. In December of 2018, we went on our honeymoon to Bora Bora, and my cycle was all over the place. So I thought I ovulated at a different time, and I should find out if I was pregnant or not on New Year's. So I took a test. It was negative. I was super bummed, but I was also fine because I wasn't really sure about when I ovulated, and I hadn't got my period and we were in Bora Bora, so I couldn't be too upset. And then a few weird things started happening. I started getting really tired. The food started tasting off, and I started to really crave chili peppers. And then on my birthday, which is New Year's Day, my dad and I went scuba diving, and we have been diving together since I was 15. And when we were underwater, all of a sudden, I felt super nauseous, like I was going to throw up. Then we got back from our trip uh, back to Australia late at night, and I woke up really early on January 9th of 2019, and I had to pee super bad, bad, so I was digging through all of our suitcases, trying to find the pregnancy test. I finally found one, peed on it, and normally my husband was never around when I took them, but of course that day he was, and he was like, what are you doing? And I told him, and I said, you know, if you're pregnant, there are two lines, but there are never two lines. And then there were two lines. So I was so shocked. And it's funny because we found out on my parents' wedding anniversary. So in total, it took us about three to four months to get pregnant. That sounds really rough, um, getting nauseous underwater. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. I was really concerned. Thankfully, I didn't throw up. But I was like, what am I going to do? Like, how am I going to throw up and breathe underwater? Right. Okay, so then how did you feel during early pregnancy? Yeah, so my pregnancy was relatively smooth. I had evening sickness for the first 15-ish weeks, and I was nauseous, but I probably only puked a total of 10 times my whole pregnancy. Brushing my teeth was horrible, and that's usually what made me puke, and normally I love brushing my teeth. I was super sensitive to fragrance. Uh, My breasts grew half a size, and I had a breast reduction when I was 21, And when I was pregnant in the first trimester, it literally felt like they were ripping at the seams. Mm. So that was a really odd sensation. And in terms of cravings, I usually eat pretty healthy, cook most of my meals, but the only thing I could really tolerate was white carbs. And my number one craving in all of my pregnancy was plain bagels with butter, salt, and red chili flakes. And as my pregnancy progressed, my number one craving was artichokes. Interesting. (laughs) So we were living in Australia, and I knew that when we had children, I wanted to have them in the U.S. to be close to my family. And I also knew that I really wanted to have a home birth. I decided this back in 2016 after listening to the first 10 or so episodes of The Birth Hour and watching The Business of Being Born. 
So I had decided this back in 2016 after listening to the first 10 or so episodes of The Birth Hour and watching The Business of Being Born. By the time that I was finally pregnant was January of 2019, so it had been three solid years of listening to hundreds and I mean, I probably listened to five to 600 birth stories across different platforms. I had done research and I'd written some of my assignments during my master's on birth. And by the time I was 23, I had already had 10 surgeries for various reasons. So I knew I hated the feeling of anesthesia. And although I'm so grateful that Western medicine exists for when it's needed, I wanted to avoid placing myself at an increased risk of medical intervention and possible surgery if I could. So I found a midwife on the Gold Coast who was a private practice midwife, and I paid her a flat rate of about $600 to see her for my care until 23 weeks. And then I Googled and researched to find a midwife and a doula in the U.S. I interviewed a midwife duo who seemed good, but then I found the most incredible doula. I'm sure everyone feels that about their doula, but she's absolutely amazing. Her name's Dakota Dawson. And as you'll soon find out, she is an invaluable part of both of my births. She's the only certified hypnobirthing instructor in Central Oregon, and she also runs a childbirth education course. Prior to working as a doula, she was also an EMT. And so I like that, that she had that medical background knowledge. I faced him with her and I instantly knew she was a perfect fit for me. And she recommended that I interview another midwife named Allegra Lilly, who's the owner of Mandala Midwifery in Ben, just to cover my bases. So I got in contact with Allegra and I knew I wanted to work with her. She's incredible. And she answered the million questions that I had. So I hired both of my midwife and doula, having only FaceTimed them each once. And when I was 23 weeks pregnant, we came back to the U.S. That's when I met all of my care providers in person for the first time. I also didn't announce on Instagram or tell many of my friends that I was pregnant. So I surprised them in person when we got back. So that was fun. Part because I thought it would be fun, but also I had a lot of anxiety and I normally have anxiety when I'm not pregnant. And with pregnancy, it definitely increased. My little brother was actually a micro preemie. He was born at 23 weeks and five days, and that was in 1997. And when he was born, he only had a 5% chance of survival. And if he did live, he had really high chance of having major complications. And miraculously, he lived and he's completely normal and healthy 25-year-old. But for me personally, in both of my pregnancies, I felt a lot of relief once that 23-week mark passed because I knew that even though it wasn't ideal, it was possible for a baby to live at that gestation. The only other thing that really was unusual about my pregnancy was that Around 32 weeks and two days, I felt a ton of movement. And then a day or two later, a lot of decreased movement. And I had an interior placenta, but I could always feel the baby. So I was worried. I had an ultrasound and found out the baby was breech. And I freaked out because at that point in time, my midwife had never delivered a breech baby and no hospitals near me would allow a vaginal breach. So I did so many things and people can contact me if they want the comprehensive list, but I did so many things to try to flip the baby. And the two things that I think that helped the most were spinning babies inversions and upside down on the ironing board and moxibustion and acupuncture. And we also didn't find out the sex of the baby. My midwife reassured me. She said, it's okay if the baby's breech at this point, we just want them to flip by 34 weeks. By 35 weeks, she palpated and she said, it felt like the baby was head down, but I wasn't sure. And so I requested an ultrasound at 36 weeks in three days. And we confirmed that the baby did flip. So that was great. In preparation for labor, I did a lot of things, birth education class, hypnobirthing, Both were taught by my doula. I listened to podcasts, Webster certified chiropractor, acupuncture, massage. And because I had already had so much knowledge of birth, I think the things that really helped me prepare the most were walking, listening to the hypnobirthing tracks at night to try to rewire my subconscious, mental preparation, and learning different breathing techniques. And I also wanted to have the birth tub available And a water birth sounded nice, but I didn't know how it would feel in the moment because I'd heard so many stories where women planned a water birth and they hated it. So like in labor, they couldn't tolerate the tub. So I just wanted to have it as an option. 
Um, and lastly, I just want to say that I loved the midwifery model of care. My midwife would come to my house and we would have appointments for one to two hours and it was amazing. All right. So any early signs of labor you want to share or things start quickly? Yeah. So I fully anticipated going two weeks over my due date. I didn't tell people what it was. I didn't want the pressure. And I barely told anyone that we are planning a home birth. At about 39 and a half weeks, I talked to the baby and I said, okay, I'm ready for you to come whenever you're ready. At 39 weeks and five days, I went to acupuncture and I asked her to help my body start getting ready, but I did not want her to put me into labor. So that was on Wednesday. And then on Saturday at 7 p.m., which was actually on my due date, my husband and I were playing backgammon and I started to have lower back cramps and was getting generally just irritated and uncomfortable. And I kept losing at the game. So I told him, I want to stop. Um, And then around midnight, I tried to go to sleep. But as soon as I lay down, I started having like electric feeling through my stomach. So I got up, I went downstairs. Pretty much straight away, I started having contractions that were three to four minutes apart. They were lasting 45 seconds, but they weren't so intense that I couldn't breathe through them. Like they were definitely manageable. I just could not lay down. And I knew I should try to rest or sleep during early labor, but I physically could not lay down at all. So that night I rotated between laying down and then when I'd get a contraction, hop up on my hands and knees on the bed or walk in the hallway. I stood and leaned on a dresser. And at some point in the night, I also took a shower and went to the bathroom and I had a tinge of pink mucus. So both my midwife and my doula told me that with first-time laborers, sometimes it will start at night, but as soon as the sun comes up, then contractions can peter out. So I didn't text anyone until around 8 a.m. And my contractions did slow down in the morning, probably spaced out to 10, 15, sometimes even 30 minutes apart. And at 8, my husband came down and I told him I didn't sleep. And he told me, well, that wasn't a good idea. (laughs) And I was like, well, I don't think you understand. Like I physically could not lay down. Like it wasn't a choice. So that morning I was able to rest on the couch. I got maybe 30 to 45 minutes of sleep um, while I was trying to watch a show And my doula had encouraged me to stay active and fed during early labor and really suggested walking uphill. So we were living in Sun River, Oregon, and where like around our house was pretty flat. So we drove to the gym and I was going to like walk uphill on the treadmill. And normally this gym is super empty. For those who don't know, Sun River has like 1,300 people who live there and it's a pretty quiet place. And anyways, this day was like a little bit stormy, drizzly. And so the gym that's normally super empty was packed. And after about five minutes of trying to walk up the treadmill and having contractions like at three minutes apart, I was like, okay, I have to leave. I cannot have these people looking at me. I didn't want them knowing I was in labor. So I decided to go walk outside and walk up the sledding hill. There's no snow because this is September, but Then I actually put on a birth hour episode and I can't remember what her name was or what episode number it was, but basically the gist of the episode was this woman used hypnobirthing and it really helped her during her labor, but she had just looked up hypnobirthing like the night before her labor and just learning those techniques helped her the next day. And that was very reassuring to me because I had been listening to hypnobirthing tracks and done the class, but I wasn't so sure it was going to be as effective as I hoped. So when we got back from the gym, I tried to eat, take a bath and take a nap, but I absolutely hated the firmness of the bathtub and it was way too hot. I just could not get comfortable or grounded. And again, the contractions were so intense that I physically couldn't lay down. They were so much more painful in that position, and I felt so out of control. So then we were just kind of hanging out. I think I bounced on the birth ball a little bit, and I mainly was alone. I didn't want to be with my husband. I didn't want to be with anyone when I was in labor. Around 7 p.m., things started to get really intense, and I started doubting myself. I felt like at that point, I was like, okay, I need support for my doula, Dakota. So we contacted her, and I thought to myself... If I had been in a hospital, I think I might get an epidural, but the process of getting in a car, driving for 30 minutes, getting checked in, waiting, that all sounded so much worse than just going through the process. 
Um, So I was really happy that I was at home. And then Dakota arrived at 9 p.m. She brought a suitcase full of tools to help. She had heat packs, a CD player with different Sonicade music, massage oil. And we were in the room where we had the crib set up and she had me sit on the birth ball. She put heat packs on my back. She gave me a massage. And she also had me put my right leg up on the edge of the crib and roll my hips and do figure eight circles with my hips. And this made things way more intense. And I told her that and she said, that's good. That's what we want. And then she put on some like drumming music. It didn't have any words, but that really helped me just like focus and just go inward. My midwife, Allegra, also called at that time. And I could have talked to her, but I didn't feel like it. So I gave the phone to Dakota. And I heard her tell Allegra she thought I was in active prodromal labor. So I thought this was a good sign that I was in active labor. But I also wanted to get things going and make sure the baby was in a good position. Because at this point, it had been like 24 to 26 hours of early labor. Uh, My mom and dad had also driven over from about four hours away, and they arrived at the same time as Dakota. Dakota told me that if we go walk the stairs up and down a few times and have a snack, that she would give me a calf massage on the toilet. So in the moment, that sounded great, but I didn't know what I was signing up for. So I went up, walked up and down the stairs a few times. I tried to eat a bagel, but it was so hard to chew while I was having a contraction. So spit that out. And then I went pee in the upstairs toilet. And I remember at this point, really using my hypnobirthing breathing. And usually with hypnobirthing contraction breathing, you inhale for 10 seconds, exhale for 10 seconds. And you also visualize a balloon inflating and deflating. And so I had modified it to be inhale for four, exhale for four. And I was visualizing like my blue balloon inflating and deflating. That helped. And then the other thing that really helped was remembering a tip that I learned years prior in a birth story on the birth hour. And this woman had said the most intense a contraction will ever get is 30 seconds in. And then it will plateau in intensity. And I found that to be true. And affirmations also really helped me. The two that stuck out were I can do hard things. And the other... I don't know if necessarily an affirmation, but just the concept of like millions, if not billions of women have done this before and our species would not be here if we hadn't done this. So just kind of tapping into that ancestral power helped me increase my confidence. And I also try to really keep my jaw and mouth relaxed because I heard that that can help your cervix relax. So then we went back downstairs and we went into a dark bathroom. I was sitting on the toilet and Dakota put a pillow behind my back and she gave me the calf massage she promised. Honestly, I can't remember if I liked it or not. Mm -hmm. Um, But this is where I went through transition and it was so intense. Each contraction lasted about a minute to a minute and a half. And at one point, my legs started shaking and I thought in my head like multiple times, I don't know if I can do this. But I had heard so many times on birth stories that that usually means you're in transition and you're so close to meeting your baby. So I thought that multiple times and then I finally verbalized it to Dakota and I said, I don't know if I can do this. And she said, you can do it. You are doing it. And we were in the bathroom for probably an hour to an hour and a half. And the thing that felt best to me throughout my whole labor was leaning forward So I remember Dakota telling me, you need to lean back through a few contractions. And if I did that, it was so painful. But she's like, if you do that, you can get in the birth tub. She really wanted to make sure my cervix had equal pressure on all sides of it. So it would dilate equally. Then my husband came down to check on us. And I heard her tell Yasin, go call Allegra. And I realized this is a good sign because she told me that she usually likes the midwife to get there an hour and a half to two hours before the baby is born. And Allegra had told me similar and she lived about an hour away. So I thought maybe I have three hours left of this. And that was about right. In the end, that ended up being true. So we went upstairs. I got naked. I got into the birth pool. And that was so much better than the bathtub. I loved that there were soft sides and there were handles to hold on to. It was amazing. And I really got a break. I actually freaked out and I thought, maybe I'm not in real labor. And I even asked Dakota what if I'm only two centimeters? What if I haven't gone through transition yet? 
Or do you think that this is the break that I've heard about after you go through transition before you start pushing? And she kind of smiled at me and laughed. And she's like, well, I don't know how far along you are, but I think that that, I'm pretty sure that was transition downstairs. So I was so relieved. I was also getting tired and my legs hurt so bad from crouching in a frog position in the birth pool. And Allegra got there at midnight. I asked her if she could check me. And I was super paranoid about my cervix swelling if I wasn't fully dilated. And she was like, yeah, if you want me to check you, I can just, you know, get out onto the bed and I can check you. And I was like, uh, there's no way I'm getting out of this birth pool. Um, so I self-checked and I could feel the baby's head about two inches inside. And I was like, yeah, I do want you to check me, but I'm not getting out. So can you just do it when I'm in here? (laughs) She was like, okay, it's not going to be as good, but sure. So she checked me and that's actually the only time I've ever had any sort of vaginal check or exam during either of my pregnancies or births. So she checked and she's like, all I can feel is the baby's head. There's no cervix. So you can push whenever you feel like you need to. And I was so relieved. And I ended up pushing in total for about an hour and 45 minutes. During that time, my contractions spaced out. They were probably like three to five minutes apart. They did not feel as intense as transition. And at some point, I ended up puking into a bucket But the things that really helped me were having like cold compresses on my head and my chest and hot water poured down my back. And then eventually my mom went and got the birth stool out of Dakota's car. And we put that birth stool, it was like a plastic birth stool, it was really cool, into the birth pool because that way I could sit and my legs wouldn't hurt as bad. Dakota had offered to go get it, but I did not want her to leave me. I was like, there's no way, like you have to stay here. So my dad was also my videographer. I did not hire a birth photographer because my husband was a little bit hesitant about having so many people present at the birth. And I knew that having more people there could delay things potentially, like in terms of the progress of labor. And even though I really wanted a birth photographer, I was like, okay, that's fine. But for the next birth, like all any future births, I'm hiring a birth photographer. So the compromise that what my dad was my videographer and we have a pretty close relationship. So that was cool. And I remember telling him, I was like, I don't want a video of my face. Like I want a video of the baby coming out. So don't take a video of my face, like get, get the good stuff. So I was sitting in like this tripod position on the birth stool, pretty like upright and a little bit leaning forward. I had a mirror at the bottom of the tub and I loved being able to watch and get the feedback of what was going on. And then about eight minutes before my baby was born, my water broke and I was like, there was tons of dark green meconium. And I kind of freaked out. I was like, oh no, there's meconium. And, but everyone was super calm and reassuring. My midwife listened to the baby with a Doppler. Its heart tones were great the entire time. And my doula actually later told me she was a little concerned and that that was the most amount of meconium she had ever seen, but she didn't let me know that in the moment. Um, I also freaked out because then I couldn't really see anything because the water was so murky. So they're trying to swish the water away with their hands so I could see. And then I started to feel the ring of fire and it was definitely a very like intentional pushing the baby out. I was using the hypnobirthing, like Jay pushing. I remember the midwife assistant, um, Amanda, saying, I know it feels like it's going to break you, but it won't. And my midwife said, once its head is out, the rest of its body is going to slip out like jelly. So I eventually pushed and the head came out. And I remember feeling the head with my left hand. And that's a moment that I will remember for the rest of my life. It was so cool to feel my baby part inside of me and then part in this world. And I asked my midwife, should I push or not? Because I wasn't having a contraction. And she said, if you feel like you need to push, you can push. So I pushed and his body came sliding out and I scooped him up. I put him on my chest and I had a really short cord. So I kind of had to like scooch up out of the water a little bit. 
And I checked and I felt that it was a boy. And I was so happy. At this point, I started crying because I was just so relieved that it was over. I was so happy he was finally here that I did it. And more than anything, I was just so happy I was finally a mom. Mm, Such an amazing story. Oh, thanks. Sounds like all the things you wanted too for someone who's been a birth nerd for... (laughs) a long time before even getting pregnant. Yeah, definitely. It was incredible. Okay. So how was postpartum with this first baby? Yeah. So after about 10 minutes, I got out of the birth pool because they wanted to monitor the bleeding. And I remember feeling like I do not want to have to deliver the placenta now. So I walked over to the bed and right before I got in the bed, I felt a little contraction some internal weight. I gave a little push and the placenta went flying out onto the carpet. And everyone was really alarmed and shocked and trying to figure out what happened. And then they realized it was the placenta, but my birth team was amazing. They got it all cleaned up. I didn't have to do anything. And then we waited for a half an hour and then my husband cut the cord. And I also had a shot of Pitocin because the bleeding was a little bit more than my midwife wanted. And just because I had low ferritin levels, I had two first degree labial tears that each needed four stitches. And in total, my early labor was 24 hours and my active labor was five to seven. So all in all, it was about 31 hours and my son weighed six pounds, 10 ounces. The immediate postpartum, like the next day, I was euphoric. I remember anticipating baby blues around day four and everyone kept asking, how I was, but that didn't happen. And instead I was just so happy and so in love. And I was kind of like waiting for the other shoe to drop, but I was just like on cloud nine. And I was also really happy with how my birth experience, I felt like I got everything that I wanted to have happen. And I didn't expect that. I have listened to enough birth stories to know that you can list out all your intentions and then you just have to go with the flow of what the universe presents to you in the moment. And so I honestly felt like my birth was so good and it couldn't have gone better. And when I would tell people about my birth, I would always emphasize, although I love my family and my whole birth team, if I had to just pick one person to be at my future birth, it would be Dakota, my doula. She helped me relax so much quicker in between contractions She helped me cope and lean into the contractions when I was having them. And I remember telling her the morning after, I don't know if I want to have another home birth in the future. Maybe it would just be so much easier to go to the hospital and get an epidural. And I remember her smiling and telling me, my future births are going to be so easy, so much easier than this. And so that was interesting. And then I also had increased anxiety around day four, but talking with my therapist helped a lot. And then I really wanted to mention that something I don't hear very often is about back pain. My vagina was a little sore for probably like four days, but it was fine. My back had so much pain. Even just laying down, I would inhale and exhale and my entire spine would crack. So that's not something I was expecting. And I ended up getting a massage a couple days later and that helped a lot. And then really quickly, breastfeeding actually went great. Because of the breast reduction, I anticipated needing to supplement. My milk came in at two days postpartum. Electric pumps had never worked on me despite correct flange sizes and settings. So I don't know why that is. Maybe the breast reduction, but the Haka was amazing. And my initial goal for breastfeeding was a day, then a week, then a month. And we ended up making it to two years and I never had to supplement. So that was the postpartum. Oh, that's so great. Yeah, amazing. Yeah, I get that question from people who have had breast reductions before. And I think they tell you when you get it, like you just don't know whether it'll affect nursing or not. So totally. They said it was so hard to know. (laughs) Yeah, because there's so many factors. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, let's go ahead and talk about the decision to try for baby number two. Yeah. So my period didn't return until I was 17 months postpartum. And when it did, my cycle was all over the place. It would take about 30 days to ovulate. And then after I ovulated, I would get my period five to six days later, which obviously is not enough time for fertilization and implantation. So I think it was because I was still breastfeeding and I had high prolactin levels, which decreased your progesterone. I actually went to a gynecologist, an OB, and two naturopaths, all who said they couldn't help me and they would not test my hormone levels, even though I requested it, because 
I was breastfeeding, they basically just told me, you need to stop breastfeeding if you want to get pregnant, which was extremely frustrating. I eventually self-diagnosed myself with a luteal phase defect, which means that second part of your cycle is not long enough, and got in contact with a different amazing naturopath who I'd previously seen. So I worked with her and a phenomenal IBCLC who suggested some Chinese herbs that were helpful for my symptoms and also safe while breastfeeding. So together with their guidance, I used the herbs. I ended up getting pregnant my first month using them. But everyone, my naturopath, my IBCLC, and my midwife all advised that as soon as I was pregnant, I should stop taking the herbs. I knew I would probably lose the pregnancy because of the low progesterone if I stopped the herbs because they help suppress like prolactin. And that's exactly what happened. Technically, it was a chemical pregnancy. I was only about three and a half weeks when this happened. So the next month, I used the herbs again. I got pregnant and then I asked my naturopath to prescribe me progesterone and I didn't go off the herbs until six or eight weeks, but I was super nervous to stop them. And then I was nervous to stop the progesterone when that came. I think that was around 15 weeks, but thankfully everything worked out. And again, with this pregnancy, my first symptom was needing to pee really bad in the morning. And my second symptom was craving the plain bagel with butter, salt, and red chili flakes. <laughs> Made a comeback, huh? <laughs> yep. All right. And then how did you feel during your pregnancy? Yeah. So I was on the progesterone until 15 weeks. I was still breastfeeding my son. I breastfed him until I was 17 weeks pregnant. So I fed him on his second birthday and then I cut him off. Overall, my pregnancy was relatively uncomplicated. I had three ultrasounds. I was extremely sensitive to scent and fragrance. And that actually got worse as my pregnancy progressed. And this pregnancy, I craved sweet things like sugar, sugar, jelly beans, soda. I don't ever normally drink or eat those things. So that was really weird. And I could also tolerate eating vegetables this time. Let's see. In my second and third trimesters, I craved roasted cauliflower, with nutritional yeast and lemon, and I could eat the whole cauliflower in one sitting. So a couple months before my due date, we moved into Bend, about 30 minutes away from where we were living. And I was planning another home birth with my same birth team. And this time I had hired the birth photographer that I really wanted. I was so excited. I shopped around and found her. I also did Pilates Reformer regularly with my physiotherapist and friend, Danny Gillum, via Zoom. She owns a studio, a women's health boutique on the Gold Coast in Australia. And she is amazing. She specializes in like pelvic floor and just like women and pregnancy and postpartum. And this pregnancy, I tried to do the spinning babies balancing exercises. It takes about five minutes. And those I found way more achievable than like the daily essentials 40 minute video that I tried to do the first pregnancy and that did not happen. So I think that those three balancing exercises definitely help the baby get in a good position. And I will add, because my first birth had gone so well, I was really nervous going into the second birth because... I felt like I got everything I wanted and I was like, what are the chances that that's going to happen again? So that's kind of the mindset I was at going into this next birth. Okay. So anything else from pregnancy you want to mention? Let's get into the birth story. Okay. I know this one went differently. So <laughs> yes. So when I was exactly 38 weeks, I got COVID for the first time. This was in February of 2022. I was really exhausted and weak for the first few days. Overall, like the sickness was fine. It just felt like I had the flu. But I was so weak that I prayed I would not go into labor because I knew that I could not give birth with that little energy. I was like 100%, I would need an epidural so I could sleep or maybe even a C-section. Like I was like, there's no way I could push a baby out right now. So I was a little bit stressed out. Also, my worst symptom was coughing and I would cough so hard. I just like constantly wore pads because I was just peeing myself all the time. So about four days later, I lost my taste and smell. And then I was really worried and a little depressed that when I had my baby, am I going to be able to smell that newborn baby smell? So at 39 weeks in one day, eight days later and 39 weeks in two, 
two days, both of those mornings, I woke up and I felt so rested. I felt completely better. And it was the best sleep that I had had in like months. I was like, wow, I feel so rested and finally felt like I had the energy to give birth. So I was very relieved. And on the morning of 39 weeks and two days, I woke up, I was making breakfast for my son Walker around 10 a.m. and noticed I was having contractions, but they didn't have any pain at all. So I assumed they were Braxton Hicks, but they did feel a little bit different. Previously, like earlier in my pregnancy, my when I was getting a massage, my massage therapist was like, have you had Braxton Hicks? And I was like, no, not at all. And she's like, oh, really? Like, I'm pretty sure you're having one right now. <laughs> Because she could see my belly like tensing up under the blankets. And I was like, oh, okay. So I guess I had been having Braxton Hicks like throughout my pregnancy. These felt a little different, but they were not painful at all. So we took our son to soccer practice and my husband stayed with him. I drove myself to Trader Joe's. I got groceries and I also got flowers because I really wanted to do like a little home photo shoot with this like lace dress and flowers like in the bath with my pregnant belly. And when I was there, my midwife called and I was like, can I call you back? So called her when I got in the car and told her, you know, I'm having some sensations, but trying to ignore them. They weren't painful. And I also had my 39 week appointment scheduled with her the next day and I was going to get the birth tub. So she's like, yep, just keep me updated. Sounds good. Just try to ignore them. So we picked up sandwiches on our way home, and I was so happy because I could finally taste and smell. It wasn't 100%, but it was definitely coming back. And we just hung out a little bit. And then from 3 to 4 p.m., I had my regular weekly like therapy session online. I've been seeing the same therapist since I was 17. Her name's Vanessa, and she's amazing. I told her... You know, I feel like the baby could come anytime now. I feel rested. My smell is coming back. And during my session, I only had like three contractions. Before that, I had been having contractions like five to 10 minutes apart, but they weren't painful. So they slowed down like to three during an hour time frame. As soon as my appointment was over, I texted my doula, I texted Dakota, gave her an update, and she suggested again go for a walk. So I told my husband, I'm going out. I went on a solo walk. It was February and it was icy. So I had like my snow boots on and my winter jacket. And as soon as my walk started, my contractions were like three to five minutes apart. On my walk, I had to stop to breathe through like maybe three contractions. I probably could have walked through them, but it was just easier to stop and breathe through them. But they were only 20 to 30 seconds long. They were not that intense. And on my walk, Dakota called me and I was like, hey, I only have 4% battery. So if my phone dies, that's what's going on. And we were talking and my phone died. So at that point, I had like 15 minutes, maybe 20 minutes to get back home. And I thought like, should I flag down one of these cars to like drive me to the bottom of this hill or should I just walk? And I was like, no, it's fine. I'm just going to walk. It'll be good for me because the contractions are like picking up. I got home and I ate so much food. I ate two and a half tortillas. I had beans, vegan Parmesan, avocado. I was like, if this is real energy labor, like I want energy. And so at 6 PM, I texted my midwife telling her, you know, things are still happening. Maybe I'm going to go into active labor. I don't know. I'll let you know. And at 6 30, I texted the birth photographer, a similar text just to give them like a heads up. Like maybe I'm going to be calling tonight. Like I think I'm going to go into labor. I called my mom around 6.30 also, and she had actually originally wanted to get here that day, but it was five days before my due date, and I did not want to be sitting around like waiting for me to have a baby. I was like, no, you cannot come. (laughs) So I called her and I was like, okay, so I think maybe you should come. Might be nothing. I don't know. But she's like, okay, I already have my car packed. She put the dog in the car. She checked like the weather cams over the mountain and she drove over. So at about 7 p.m., my husband was tidying up and cleaning the house and I was a little tired. So I tried to lay down and rest, but I couldn't. And I was like, oh no, this is a mistake. Like not again, like not being able to lay. And then I took a three minute shower, which was super intense 
So after the shower at 819, I called Dakota and I said, I feel like I need you, but it is too early to need you. So we talked for about 10 minutes and I was having 20 second contractions that I needed to stop our conversation and breathe through. And in between the contractions, I was totally normal, very cognitive. We decided that like she would get to my house in 40 minutes or so. She needed to like get ready and shower, cancel everything for the next day. And I was like, do you know, do you think I should call Allegra and like tell her to come? Or do you want to just assess me once you get here? Because Dakota, the doula, she's been to almost 500 births. She has 11 years of experience and she is great at assessing where a mom is in their labor. She's only had out of all those births, like one baby that was delivered with just her. So she's like, you know, maybe wait until I'm there and I can see you in person, but ask Allegra. So I called Allegra after, same thing, had like a 10 minute conversation, was stopping to breathe through contractions. I was completely coherent between contractions. My midwife told me later, she's like, they were only 20 seconds long. We were having a full on conversation. So she's like, yep, I'm so happy for Dakota to assess you when she gets there. But just remind her that I have the birth tub and I'm an hour away. So I texted Dakota, told her that. And then I had my husband do the three balancing exercises and my contractions were probably one to two minutes apart because I had to stop in between each exercise and they're only about a minute long. I was like, okay, I'm going to go downstairs. My husband was putting our son to sleep. Our son stopped napping when he was two. But that day when I had my therapy session, he fell asleep on like an indoor inflatable swing that we have. And so it was taking him a long time to fall asleep. And I got downstairs, I put on my hypnobirthing tracks and that made things way worse. Like I was like, where's my phone? I got to turn this off. Like, oh my God. So after that contraction, turned the tracks off. I took the couch cushion over and I put it on the kitchen counter and I was standing with like my arms leaning up like resting on it with my head there and like swaying my hips back and forth. And I realized that because Yasin was putting Walker to sleep, I needed to go unlock the front door so that when Dakota got here, she could just come in. So I had a contraction. I walked to the door, unlocked it, turned off all the lights on the way, got back, had another contraction. And this is when I was like, okay, things are getting really intense. But still, the contractions were only 20 to 30 seconds long. So in my mind, I was like, I am so screwed. Like, I am crazy. Why am I doing this without an epidural? We need a change of plans. I need to go to a hospital. This is nuts. I cannot do this. So I was like freaking out. And I was a little bit worried that I felt like this so early on because I'm like, oh my God, labor is just starting and this is how I feel. And I was like, I don't think I can do this for like five to seven more hours At 8.39, I texted my midwife that I had had a little bit of tinted pink mucus again. At 8.59, I called my mom and I had less than a minute conversation with her. I said, where are you? She told me she was passing Detroit Lake, which is two hours away from me. So that wasn't helpful. And I was like, I don't think I can do this. She said, you've done it before. You can do it again. And I said, okay, got to go. Bye. (laughs) And I hung up on her. Then at nine o'clock, my midwife was texting me asking if I had retested for COVID because her assistant was having elective surgery. And I was like texting her full text, like, no, I didn't retest. This is the current guidelines. We're not symptomatic anymore. It's been nine days or 10 days or whatever. At 9.05, Dakota, my doula, texted me and said, I'm headed to you. She lives about 10 minutes away. I texted her back and I said, great, because I definitely need you. I'm in the kitchen in the dark. The front door is unlocked. Yasin's upstairs putting Walker to sleep, so just come in when you get here. So I'm all by myself in the kitchen. My legs started shaking. Then I puked in my mouth. I ran to the sink because I did not want to puke and have to clean it up puked two more times. And then I realized, oh my God, these are signs of transition. But I was still in denial because I was doing my hypnobirthing breathing, inhaling to four, exhaling to four, visualizing my balloon, inflating, deflating. And the first breath was a little bit intense. The second and third breaths were really hard. And after that, it was fine. So my contractions were maybe 30 to 40 seconds. 
in a thought. I'm texting, I'm thinking, I'm using my brain. These aren't that long. There's no way that I'm close. Like there's no way that I'm in transition. I kept checking the time and I was thinking, this feels like a long time. It was 930 and Dakota wasn't there. I was thinking, where is she? I hope she's okay. Like, did she slip on ice? At 935, I called her and she didn't answer. Then at 937, I texted Yasin and I said, because I didn't want to scream and wake up Walker if he was almost asleep and restart that process. So I texted him and I said, help me. And then I said, please. And then another text, are you almost done? And at 938, one minute later, he texted me, but I didn't see that. I heard him walk down the stairs and I also heard the door open. So all of a sudden, I went from being alone to both my doula and my husband there. And I said, I am so scared. I cannot do this. She said, you're doing great. I'm here. She helped me breathe. She like, I loved how she would help me breathe, like put her hands like up and down my back and just like help show me physically like where to move my breath. And then I said, I think I need to poop. And in my mind, I was like, hmm, people usually say that when they're about to have a baby, (laughs) but She said, you know, you might actually need to poop because you just ate so much food. And we were walking from the kitchen to the bathroom. And for whatever reason, I felt like it was really important to point out to her the birth ball because she had asked me like, oh, you have a birth ball. And I told her on the phone, yes, I do. I was like, there's the birth ball. It's like in the hallway. We're passing it. I'm like, there it is. I have the ball right there in case we need it. (laughs) And we did not need it. But I just think that's funny. Like the things that you think are important in the moment, it's like so irrelevant. (laughs) (laughs) Totally. And very obvious. She could see the ball. But I walked into the bathroom. Our lights are auto sensor. So I walked in, the lights turned on. I immediately turned them off. And Dakota was like, I'm going to be right here. So she waited right outside the door. I did one little like squirt of like a fluff poop. And then I was like, oh my God, I need you. And she's like, okay, I'm right here. I'm right here. She gave me a like kind of hugging me while I'm sitting on the toilet. And in my mind, I was like, oh my God, this is so intense. This is not just a poop. And I was like, oh my God, I'm pushing. So my body started pushing on its own and she was trying to help me breathe and stay calm. And my husband was like, oh, should I go set up for the waterproofing for the birth tub? And she was like, uh, no, like you need to call Allegra, tell her to come now. Then my water broke on the toilet and she's like, okay, we have to go to the hospital because I can lose my like credentials if I know that birth is imminent and I don't call for backup, it's negligence. And I was like, nope, I am, there's no way I'm not going to the hospital. And she's like, okay, Austin, call Allegra, call the birth photographer. And he's like, I already called her. And she's like, call her again, tell her that her water broke. So Yasin's thinking the same thing, like about the timeline from the first birth, you know, the baby's going to be here in two to three hours, same as the first time. And at 942, he called our midwife, told her to leave now. And I told Dakota, no one's going to make it. And she's like, okay, I need to turn on the lights to see what's happening. And I was like, nope. And she, we kind of had a back and forth and I was like, don't turn them on. She's like, I need them on. My husband's like, what do I do? And she's like, turn the lights on. I need to see. So he turned them on. I didn't know that they ever went on because my eyes were closed. And again, like my first birth, I was so nervous that I was only going to be like two centimeters dilated and that I would swell my cervix. So I went to feel if there was a head and the head wasn't coming out yet, but I could feel there was like a bowling ball about to come out. And I remember thinking, oh my God, there is a baby coming out. And at this point I was thinking, I wish I could record this. Maybe my phone is like to my right. I wish someone, I wish I like, wish I could tell them like make a video. But even though I was thinking that there's no way that I could verbalize it or do it myself. Yeah. So anyways, I had the fetal ejection reflex again. My body pushed on its own. I half stood up from the toilet in like a semi squat. My left foot was flat on the ground and my right heel was lifted. And I was leaning towards my left side, like on the shower door railing. And my right hand was on my vagina. And with one contraction, the entire head flew out. Like I just felt the whole head go into my hand. Wow. (laughs) It was so crazy. Dakota was like, okay, like with the next contraction, give a little push. I gave a little push and the entire body flew out into Dakota's hands. 
she didn't even have gloves on. Like it was so fast. And I opened my eyes. I saw vernix on the right side of the baby's back. And I tried to pull the baby up to my chest. But again, I had a super short cord. And my whole pregnancy, we didn't find out what it was. I was pretty sure it was a girl. Um, I just kept referring to it as she and her. And then in the moment, like, I felt like it was a girl, but it was hard to tell because the cord was so tight, like, through its crotch. And so a little bit later, I asked Dakota, like, is it a girl? And she's like, yeah. And so I was so excited. Mm -hmm. So yeah, so she was born at 9.50. My doula and husband had arrived at 9.38. So 12 minutes before she was born, they both arrived. And actually at 9.49, my husband had called 911 because my doula wanted him to call just in case, like, I hemorrhaged because she doesn't have any medical equipment. And anyways, the 911 call is so funny. They're like, what's your emergency? And my my husband's like, I think my, my wife is going into labor. <laughs> and then <laughs> 50 seconds later, you hear the baby crying. And I was like, oh my God. <laughs> so, and I also like a few weeks later was looking through my husband's phone and I completely forgot that I had taken selfies with my daughter while I was sitting on the toilet that I didn't remember taking. Um, I was like looking for the pictures and I was like, oh my God. So, and then Dakota looked at me and she's like, you better be careful what you wish for. Cause you know, I had said after my first birth, if I could only have one person there, it would be her. And she's like, you got exactly what you wanted. Oh my gosh. (laughs) So, and the craziest thing is like why she was so late. So she said she was going to be there. Like she should have been there around like 9.15. It was so cold that night that the lock on her car door was frozen. So she had to get an extension cord and a blow dryer. Oh, that's so stressful. I know. She was unthawing her door for like 20 minutes. Wow. And then she got pulled over by the police and on the way here because she was speeding. And they gave her a ticket. And she's like, I'm on my way to a birth. Like, no one is with the mom. I have to go. And they didn't care. Later, we got it dismissed. But um, so that was crazy. And my husband called my mom and had given her an update, like told her baby was here. And my mom's like, yeah, right. And she's like, well, how's Jen? And Yasin's like, well, she's happy because it's a girl. And my mom got here and she did not believe that I had the baby until she saw her. So that was the birth. And it was crazy because both of my kids were born on the same day of the month and the same day as my dad was born. And they are two years and five months apart to the day. That is so amazing. And yeah, some of the pictures you sent me for the show notes page are pretty... Like, I just had the biggest grin on my face. Like, I cannot believe this. (laughs) And that's kind of how your face looks in one of them, too. You're like, what just happened? Yeah, Yeah, definitely. We got the 911 call back. And there's, like, I'm definitely cussing a lot. And my doula's like, these are your baby's first moments of life. And then I just, like, gently, softly swore. (laughs) Um, So, and then the postpartum was, I keep it pretty short for this, but basically... Two ambulances rocked up. It took them 13 minutes to get here, which I felt like was a long time. Mm -hmm. If I was hemorrhaging, that would have been a long time. But two ambulances, they were six young men paramedics. None of them had kids. They showed up and they saw Dakota and they're like, oh my God, thank God someone who knows what's going on is here. (laughs) And she she was like, "Um, I'm just a doula. Like, even though she's been to so many births and she totally knew you know, what's going on and what to look out for. She's like, this is outside of my scope of practice. But we were on phone with 911 and they were telling us like how to like cut the cord. And then the paramedics gave like, so we did it with dental floss with the 911 operator. And then the paramedics gave her clamps and she's like, aren't you going to do this? And they were like, no, it's fine. You can do it. (laughs) And they weren't really checking me. They looked at me visually, but They're like, yeah, she looks good. If she was going to hemorrhage, she would have already done that. And they weren't even like looking in the toilet to monitor blood loss or anything. And so I had like moved to the ground. I had delivered the placenta. And when my midwife was still 20 minutes away, because she lives an hour away from me, they were like, okay, so we're going to go. We'll be in the area. So if you need us, just call us again. And we were like, what? So uh, once the labor was over and the birth happened... Honestly, it was not that intense compared to my first labor. I just definitely freaked out in the moment because 
it was so intense. But had I known my baby was going to be born 40 minutes later, I feel like mentally it would have been so much easier. And it was just so weird because it did not follow the normal pattern of labor. My contractions never got longer than 30 seconds and I was, you know, using my brain. So that was really crazy. And I ended up being the second baby ever that my doula has caught. Um, And then in terms of physical recovery, my vagina felt totally normal. I did not feel like I just had a baby. I didn't even need to use like a peri bottle when I peed. Like it was just really weird. And this time though, my back pain was even worse. Thankfully, I saw my chiropractor the next morning and that helped a lot. And again, I was really euphoric. I did not feel like I just went through this process. I didn't experience the baby blues. I did have increased anxiety. And that night we could not sleep, even though she was born at 9.50 at night, we were just in complete shock Yeah, that we just had a baby in basically like my active labor was an hour and a half. So that was nuts. And breastfeeding also thankfully went really well and I didn't need to supplement and we are still going strong at 21 months. Amazing. And do you still want four kids? I do still want four kids. <laughs> we're trying to space these ones out a little bit more. Um, I feel like once the older ones get a little bit older, it will be easier. Yeah. But yeah, I definitely still want four kids. Okay. So the next birth, you'll have everyone, maybe a midwife that lives closer to the house. I know. My doula was like, ah, you need to like, let me know right away next time. (laughs) So yeah, it was, it was crazy. And I'm just like so grateful and thankful to you, Bryn, for sharing all of these birth stories for all of these years. I know it's a lot of work, but I really feel like you have helped transform the birth culture in our country and just raise so much more awareness. And at the end of the day, I am just like so passionate about women having empowering, like beautiful births, whatever that looks like to them. And I think the best way to do that is just increasing knowledge and awareness around birth. And so I just want to say thank you so much. I think what you do is absolutely amazing. Well, thank you. And thanks for being a long time listener. It's always fun. I forget that it's even been around since 2016. (laughs) Oh, of course. All right. Well, any resources you want to highlight at the end? Um, I will send them all over to you, but they're pretty much the standard ones. If I had to pick two, I would say Ina May's Guide to Childbirth and the Business of Being Born. I feel like that one's getting a little dated right now, that documentary, but the content is still really good. Okay. And then where's the best place for people to connect with you? Yeah. Uh, I sent you my email for the show notes page. People can reach out to me on Instagram at Jen Berzik. Um, I'm not really active on social media anymore, but if they want to reach out and connect, they can do so there. And if anyone has any questions about, you know, all the things I did to flip the breech baby or breastfeeding post breast reduction, I'm, I'm happy to answer any questions. All right. Well, thank you so much, Jen. Of course. Thank you, Bryn. All right. Now I'm going to talk with Kara from SMP Therapeutics, today's sponsor, all about their Genate test. And remember, you can use the coupon code BIRTHHOUR15 for 15% off at genate.com, G-E-N-A-T-E.com. All right. Let's hear from Kara. Hi, Kara. Thank you so much for coming on the podcast today to chat with me about the Genate test and the work that you guys are doing at SMP Therapeutics. Absolutely. Thank you for having me. Before we get into that discussion, can you tell listeners a little bit about you and your background? Yes, for sure. Um, So I'm a registered dietitian. I completed my education at Texas A&M University and University of Kentucky Hospital. Um, I have focused my work on um, neonatal and pediatric populations. Um, I really love serving moms who are pregnant and their babies right after birth, as well as into childhood. Um, I am also a healthcare writer. So I, along with counseling patients and having a clinical background, I also do some healthcare writing as well. Amazing. All right. Well, let's just jump right in. And can you tell us what is the Genate test and why is it so important for during pregnancy? So the Genate test is a prenatal screening test that was developed by Dr. Steven Zeisel, who is a nutrition and genetic researcher um, from the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. And it is a test that looks at the different nutrient pathways that are critical for brain development for babies during pregnancy and through the first couple years of life. 
All right. So I know one of the things that we're looking at with that is different aspects of nutrition and how your genetic makeup relates to that. So one of the things that we see is the one carbon and fatty acid nutrition. So you can talk about why those are important during pregnancy. Mm -hmm, Absolutely. Yeah. So with our prenatal genate test, um, we do focus on the metabolic pathways that are needed um, for the metabolism of one carbon nutrients and essential fatty acids. And um, many women, I think, today are familiar with one of the one carbon nutrients, which is folate. Um, That nutrient has been shown to be very important for development of the neural tube and the brain. And we know that women who are deficient in folate in pregnancy do have a higher risk of having babies with neural tube defects. Um, A lot of us are also familiar with the fatty acid that we test for in the gene test, which is called DHA. Um, A lot of prenatal supplements and infant formulas are now fortified with DHA because it is so critical for development of a baby's brain as well as the retina of the eye. We also, though, look at other one carbon nutrients needed for proper development in a baby's brain. Um, I'll just run through the list of the ones that the gene test um, does look at. Um, one of those is choline. We also test for betaine, which is made in the body from choline. And we also look at a group of vitamins and minerals. Um, one of the big ones there are the B vitamins. They're needed in those one carbon nutrient pathways as well. And the reason that we test for all of those nutrients together um, is that these pathways in the body are interrelated. So if a woman has a genetic misspelling that's affecting how her body metabolizes one of those nutrients, it could affect her diet requirements for that nutrient as well as the other one carbon nutrients. Um, Again, because those pathways all affect each other and they're all very closely related. So the test is testing more for your ability to metabolize these things versus your current levels of these nutrients. Is that right? Absolutely. Yes. That's a very good point. Um, yes. The gene test is testing for your genes that code for the enzymes needed to metabolize nutrients. So it's not testing for nutrient levels in the body. It's really looking at your genetics, which determines how effective your body is at using the nutrients that you're eating in your diet. And then from there, um, you can make changes as needed. For instance, if a woman, we know from Dr. Zeisel's research, actually, that about 45% of women have a genetic misspelling in the gene that codes for metabolism of um, choline. And as I said, choline is one of the key nutrients needed for proper brain development. So if a woman has that genetic misspelling, she's going to need to eat more choline. And there's another form of choline that she may need to eat more of as well to help bypass that inefficiency in that nutrient pathway. That's very cool. It sounds like it's really a deep dive versus what we're used to getting, you know, at our annual appointment where they just test for our levels and then, you know, kind of send you on your way because there's a big range of what's, you know, quote unquote normal. Absolutely. That is so true. And that's what makes me so excited about this um, gene test. It's really a tool that women can use to be empowered um, to target their nutrition during pregnancy and then also during lactation to what their body needs. And that way they can really provide optimal nutrition for themselves and for their babies. All right. So can you tell us what SNPs are and how they impact nutrition during pregnancy? So SNP stands for single nucleotide polymorphism, and that is just a long word, um, basically Mm -hmm. for a genetic misspelling. So our genes need to be spelled correctly um, to work correctly. And so if we have one, a copy of one gene or two copies of a gene that are misspelled, um, there could just be one letter, so to speak, that's out of place. Um, that will cause the gene not to work as effectively as it should. And the reason that's so important for nutrition during pregnancy is, again, that every step in the one-carbon nutrient pathways that are so critical for a baby's cognitive development, every step in those pathways is coded for by a gene. So if a woman has a gene that is misspelled, um, her body just will not be as efficient at metabolizing one or more nutrients. And that can feel daunting um, for a woman who orders the DNA test and sees the results, but it's really a great tool. As I said before, it's a way to be empowered to target your nutrition approach to what your body needs rather than simply saying, I need 400 micrograms of folate a day because that's what the national recommendation is. That may be enough for you, but based on your test results, you may see, no, I actually need more folate because my body, due to the SNPs that I have, is not as efficient at metabolizing it. So I need more than that in order to give my baby enough for their development. 
Okay, I hope everybody's keeping up. I'm trying to get, you know, through all this jargon. But yeah, so SNPs, it's SNP, uh, which is where the SNP Therapeutics name came from. So I had to ask questions about that prior to our recording as well. So um, I know it's tricky via audio, but we'll have more information on the show notes as well. Um, All right, so when should women consider getting the GNA test? That's a great question. Um, If a woman is considering getting pregnant, it's a great time before they get pregnant to have the gene test done and um, see if they have any inefficiencies or roadblocks in their one carbon nutrition. I have heard Dr. Zyacel recommend about six to seven months before getting pregnant. That way you can make sure your body's stores of these nutrients um, are adequate and you're ready for a healthy pregnancy. However, anytime during pregnancy, even after you've had a baby, if you're breastfeeding, you can still get the gene test and find out if there are changes you can make to your diet or possibly supplements that you're taking to make sure that you're getting enough of those nutrients. Because we know these one carbon nutrients and essential fatty acids um, do come through in breast milk and can positively impact infants as well. Okay. And where do we go to get the gene test? Yes. So some women, um, they can have a recommendation from their healthcare provider for the test. Um, we do have OB physicians and, um, other healthcare professionals that, you know, tell their patients about it, but anyone who's interested can actually purchase the test directly from www.genate.com. And that's spelled G E N A T E.com. You can take a nutrition survey before you actually get the test um, before it arrives at your home. And that's great because you can see where your diet is at now and what levels of those nutrients you currently have in your diet. And then the test will be sent to your home. It's an at-home saliva test, very easy to take. Um, and you just follow the instructions and collect your sample and then mail it in and our lab processes it. Okay. And then you get back this report from Gene 8. And what does that look like? Is it easy to understand? I know, like I was mentioning earlier, those annual exam blood work is always really confusing. So how does this one look? Yes, absolutely. So the report is easy to understand. Um, I will say it's it's very educational. There's a lot of details because this is it's kind of a complicated field, right? We're looking at the intersection of genetics and nutrition. Um, so there's a lot of information in it, but we do break it down into what SNPs does a client have? What nutrients are those SNPs affecting? And then we give recommendations based on the results of her nutrition survey and her genetic results. So we combine those into diet recommendations. Um, and that will show what levels of nutrients we're recommending that she eats um, every day. And that can be a combination of diets and supplements. Um, and although they are easy to understand, as I said, they're pretty in-depth. And we understand that some women may want extra support and guidance in implementing any changes that they may need to make. Um, And so we do provide nutrigenetic counseling with licensed dietitians. And women can either have just one counseling session if they want to just help them kind of interpret those results and figure out where to go from there. Um, We also have women who like to do a nutrition counseling session once a month as they go through pregnancy. Other women may want to do one session per trimester since calorie needs can change through pregnancy. Um, And sometimes based on weight gain, you might need to adjust your calories, you know, up or down. So we have a variety of different ways that we can go with that, but we do provide counseling with dietitians um, just to help clients, just to give them extra support and help them implement those changes. Very cool. Yeah. One thing that I was really excited about with this test when I first heard about it was we talk pretty regularly on the podcast about the MTHFR gene mutation. And I know that you don't even know you have it until unfortunately you've often had several miscarriages. So is this, this is something that you could find out from this test, right? Absolutely. Yes. So that is one of the enzymes that's involved in the folate pathway. Um, and the gene eight test definitely looks at that and you're right. That's, that's one that's been in the news a lot lately and it's very important in field development for sure. And then you would get recommendations on the type of folate that would be best for you based on that, right? Mm -hmm, Absolutely. So, yes. So if a woman had a blockage um, in that MTHFR gene, um, she would not be able to make as much um, methylfolate. So she might need to, rather than taking a standard prenatal supplement that has synthetic folic acid in it, she could do a supplement that has methylfolate. So she's providing the product of that pathway to her body rather than having her body have to synthesize it um, from folic acid, which if she has that SNP, she may not be able to do. 
Yeah. And there's just so many more that I don't, you know, that many of us don't even know about. So I think this is really cool, especially for those of us who are very into science and want to just kind of take control of our healthcare as much as possible. Mm -hmm, Absolutely. It's a very exciting tool for sure. All right. So last big question is how much does the test cost? The regular price of the test is $279, but Geniate right now is discounting the test and offering it as a package. So women can order the test and a nutrigenetic counseling session for $299. Essentially, that gives you the nutrition counseling session for $20, which is a pretty good deal. <laughs> yeah, amazing. All right. So we'll link to it in the show notes and right in your podcast app where you're listening to this. But yeah, just head over to genate.com to look into getting this test. Thank you so much for your time today, Kara. Absolutely. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you so much again to Jen for sharing her stories with us and to SP Therapeutics for sponsoring this episode. I will be sure to link to the Genate test and include the coupon code in the show notes and in the podcast app where you're listening to this episode. To find the show notes page, just head to thebirthhour.com and search for Jen's name in the search bar. Thanks so much for listening. If you enjoyed today's show, head to thebirthhour.com and click become a member to pledge your support. And as a thank you, you'll get an invitation to join our private Facebook group and access to exclusive episodes. Your vote of confidence and support means the world to me.